Hi, I'm Tony Giddens, director of the Washington DC Film Festival. This is our 34th year, bringing wonderful films to Washington DC from around the globe. And uh, this year though, we're gonna go virtual, which means that all of our films, all of our presentations will come to you through the internet. Uh, the advantage is that now you get to watch these films right from the comfort of your own home. Today, we're going to be talking about Made in Bangladesh. And we have with us the director of the film, Rubiat Hussein. Rubiat is one of the few filmmakers who are women in Bangladesh. This is a third film. It premiered in the Toronto Film Festival. And we're so glad to be able to show it and bring it to folks here in DC. Talking to Rubiat will be Manjula Kumar. Manjula, who is a very close friend of mine, uh, she is the former director of educational programs at the Smithsonian. She is an actress and she's a producer and she's a filmmaker and she's an activist. Uh, she's also a member of the Film Fest DC jury. Uh, so thank you both Manjula and Rubiette. And I'm sure you guys are gonna have a great time. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Tony, and good luck for the first online festival. Yay! It's going to be great, and we're going to reach far more audiences. And we're so glad to have Rubaiyat Hossein with us. Hello. Hi, Manjula. I'm so glad. You know, we would have been face to face in April when we were going to show the film, but this, you know, is better than nothing. And I'm sure we're going to reach many, many newcomers and congratulations for the selection of your film. I was so engaged. It's such a powerful film. While the theme, the text, you know, right now in this country all over the world, we're talking about women's rights and um, violence, no violence against women. But your film, just like any other artwork, has such an amazing, such an individual signature to it. And of course, the scenes and all, to me, it's a very powerful film, not only, again, because thematically, but your style. It's completely your style. Sometimes, you know, when people come out of uh, cinema schools and all, they have what's very bookish cinema, but your um, camera work, your selection, and obviously, so much research must have gone into the making of this film. So to start off with, I would just love to know and to share with our viewers um, the time you took, the research, and what does it mean to you personally? Thank you. Um, well, this film was a difficult one for me. Uh, because I was going to make a film about an actual person, uh, which is something I've not done before. Um, and the process really started in 2016. Um, the initial research was uh, me reading the literature and watching the existing films and documentaries about factory workers. And then the second phase of research is when I went in and started meeting actual workers at their homes. I did not meet them at the factory because I wanted to also get a sense of their personal lives and um, you know how they operate within the domestic space. So I wanted to do that. Um, and in doing that, what I realized is I was meeting women who are actually very strong. They're not victims. Uh, they're very powerful and they're feisty. They're happy also. You know, they have so much young spirit. And exactly. that... Okay. And that really attracted found, Yes, the women that you have put, and you must tell us a little bit more about Shimu, the protagonist, that even though you're showing the women as being exploited and uh, there's so much against them, but all of them have this, uh, just the feisty spirit, the strength. In fact, at the end of watching the film, I said, oh my God, this could be an ode to womanhood. You know, even what the husband is doing to the wife and um, the mother, you know, to the daughter selling off, but it's the women's strength 
And that's what stays with you, which is such a powerful message and the underlying theme to the film. So how did you kind of, and keep that balance, you know, it's subtle in many ways, it's strong in many ways, but it's not blatant, you know? Well, I guess it all just came together uh, because there has been two years in the research and the writing of the film. Um, and the actors were also preparing themselves uh, for a very long time. Shimu, uh, the actor who plays Shimu, her name is also Shimu in real life. Is she popular? Is she a popular actress or? Uh, she's she's coming from the, mainly from the theater background. Um, hmm. So she's only working with art house directors. Uh, yeah. This is her first lead role. Uh, she beautiful. was also it's beautiful yeah. expressions. Yeah, yeah. She, she's amazing, and she knew that she was going to do the film when I was writing the treatment. Uh, so she started going to factories and observing the workers very early on. Uh, and the woman Dalia Akhtar, whose life the film is based on, she also worked very closely with us in scripting. Is that a true story? It's based on real events, yes. It's based on a woman named Dalia Akhtar. Uh, and the events that you see in the film are uh, events that happened in her life in 2013 when she became one of the first uh, union presidents. And um, so she was part of the team of writing mm -hmm. and filming and training my actors. So it was really a collaboration um, mm -hmm. because I wanted the film to become um, the story of this actual woman that I had met. I do not have experiences of working in factories, so I cannot be truthful unless I have somebody who has that experience. Okay. Yes, yes. Now, the theme, as I said earlier, it's such a universal theme all over the world and much more so since the Me Too movement, you know, that we're looking at. And while your film, yes, set in Dhaka, talking about Bangladesh, but I could see this anywhere, right here in Washington, D.C., in India, where I'm from. You know, I was born in Kolkata, so I do speak Bengali, and that added to my um, enjoyment of the film. So, and this film is uh, being shown in festivals. Uh, has it been shown in Bangladesh at all? Not yet, because in Bangladesh, we have to pass to the censor board in order to screen a film. Uh, and we started that process in March, but then everything closed down. Um, so we have to do that process of applying to the censor board where they will watch the film and then they will decide whether or not um, they will let me show the film. Mm -hmm. So the when they're trying to form the trade unions, right? And, but that's all based in like in 2016, did the women get the to, registration? No, it, it was in 2013, yes, they, they did get the registration. And um, so in Bangladesh today, there are certain groups of women who are bonding, who are, I just love the bonding of the women. It was so truthfully done you know, where they are hesitant, they're prepared to give up their or risk their jobs or even relationships to um, support each other, but also for the cause without really knowing about it as such. Isn't that so? That they weren't quite aware of the risk they were taking and how much it might affect their private lives? Well, you know, for Dahlia, the woman who inspired the film, for her, uh, learning about human rights, learning about women's rights was life-changing because she found certain dignity uh, in learning that language. So she wanted to do it also for herself, you know, because by doing this, she was elevating herself and she did get into a lot of trouble at home. Yes. Uh, for talking on the mobile phone, for keeping long hours, for meeting, uh, having meetings and going to places. But this is something that she really wanted to do for herself and also for the women around her because, you know, she was no longer a woman or a worker that uh, somebody could uh, dominate. She learned that she has these rights. She learned a new vocabulary when she goes to these meetings. 
see, she must have a lot of what we, you know, women coming from that part of the world, or even here, trying to say that women have the basic intelligence. I was so impressed and so moved also by the way she learns quickly. You know, she learns about law, she learns about how to use the um, phone and is prepared to take so many risks. You know, when she tries to shut the door, I love that scene <laughs> to the men. Now, all the men in the film are sort of weak but overpowering in a weak way even the sir the um, official sort of trying to find the easy way out but somewhere along i guess he had to help in the next step to sign off but was he because he was um, he was left, left no choice Yes, right. he was left no choice and he also felt like what happened in real life that he he had no choice and he also saw how desperate this woman was. Um, and what she was asking for was justified, you know. If she had gone to the press or created a scene there, then it would reflect very badly on the officer. So she flipped the power structure within that, you know, mm -hmm. in that room. She flips the power structure by blackmailing him. So you had the journalist who was helping them, who first brought in the seed for forming a union and empowerment and their rights. Then you had the other woman who was, so is there a kind of elitism as well that is responsible for exploitation of women? That do women have that socioeconomic echelon to deal with as well? Yes, of course, uh, because you see that, uh, because of course, most of these women who are working for these human rights organizations or even the leftist organizations are educated middle class. Um, and I, I wouldn't say there's exploitation. I think actually within that space, you know, I've worked with women's rights organizations in Bangladesh, and I think that's a space where uh, women can actually transgress a little bit and the class barriers and uh, be, be in solidarity with each other, with each other, you know, because there's a, there's a scene where Shimu says to Nasima Appa that we are women, we are screwed if we're married, we're screwed if we're not married. And it's kind of like a moment that it's true for Nasima as well, probably. Um, so I think that I wanted to show that there's all these resources that are available to women um, and these resources are uh, these women's rights organizations that actually educate women workers. You know, I've worked with organizations who have done tremendous work with sex workers in Bangladesh. And um, so one scene where I think it's these foreign investors who come to visit the factory with the factory owners, right? So, so far we as viewers see that the factory owners are exploiting the women. But what was, it wasn't quite explained, what was the role of the foreign investors, which we've heard a lot and read a lot in reality in media, you know, when that big fire happened as well in uh, Dhaka. So I was wondering, was that something you didn't want to address or um, was just hinted at? I wasn't sure. Well, I did not want to write a foreign character into the film because the mm -hmm. film was shown from Shimu's perspective, you know. So yeah, the foreign yeah. character would come in just as much. Shimu would be able to, you know, uh, in, in, within her vision, she, in that's all she would see is this man coming in and walking through the aisles. And, you know, they're <laughs> actually asking for lower prices. So you see how even the foreign buyers and the corporations are also uh, telling the local owners that we want cheaper price. Yes, yes. And when she realizes what's the worth, you know, of the t-shirt versus how much it's sold for and her own salaries, right? So I, I must say that 
the end happened kind of abruptly for me. I was sitting there and saying, oh, no, I want to know more. What happened? What happened after, you know, she comes out? So I guess you want to leave it to the viewer to think and imagine or whatever, that what could have been next steps for her. Yeah, you know, it could be another movie. And we are actually talking about a sequel because when you... Uh, register the union you've just taken one step you know there's a whole nother battle that has to be waged after that once you have the union you have to submit your demands you have to negotiate you have to establish um, your rights and uh, in real life it was quite su successful actually you know in real life she was able to get the things that she wanted for herself and the workers uh, but later their factory got closed down um, and she had to go work as a migrant worker in Jordan. So you see that the fight kind of goes on. And the factory closed down because? The factory closed down. This is also very interesting. And the factory closed down because, you know, in 2013, there was a Rana Plaza collapse in Bangladesh. Yes. Uh, and as a result of that, the government, the buyers, the factory owners, everybody started taking notice. Uh, Accord Alliance was formed and they looked after safety measures in buildings and a lot of factories were closed. Thousands of factories were closed down during that time because they were not compliant with the safety requirements and this uh, factory did not comply. So, you know, it was even it was unionized, the factory got closed down and all the workers lost their jobs. I've already been discussing actually since April when I first saw the film and we were going to have the, <clears throat> the festival discussing the film. I have a lot of friends from Bangladesh, from India, with the similar, you know, themes and problems that we discuss. And I was wondering, <clears throat> issues were raised that was this, I mean, it doesn't have to be blatantly anti-Bangladesh or is it for the, for the women? And I don't, I keep saying it's not only from Bangladesh, it's about women from anywhere today, today, not just, you know, Bang. So has there been any um, problems with the government or anything with the film? Not yet, because we haven't screened it in Bangladesh and it's a co-production. So, you know, it, it has been sold to different territories and those territories have been, you know, like France released the film and the US, yeah. Canada, yeah. So they yeah. released the film and in Bangladesh, I haven't passed the censor board yet. Uh, there has been uh, audiences who've seen the film at Toronto, you know, there's a lot of Bangladeshis there. It's screened at BFI, there are a lot of uh, Bangladeshis who watched it there, even factory owners. Mm -hmm. and, and they appreciated the film, you know, because I don't think it shows I don't think it shows uh, victimhood, you know, I think it shows that these jobs are also important to empower these women. Uh, and mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong in asking for a better condition. They want the jobs. They say that in the film that we want the jobs, but we have to fight to make it better. In fact, if it anything, it shows progress. You know, there's social, there's economic, legal legal progression and with women as we all say women are the culture bearers women are the history makers you know women uh, women's roles in society matter so much so if all that you know is brought up and there shouldn't be any problem i you know i think this film is going to be a huge huge success not only here for our festival but as you said, it's being shown, you know, all over. So what's next for you, Rubaiyat? I'm working on a few projects. I also work as a producer. So I have a project that I'm producing that's in financing right now. Um, okay. I have a script that I'm working on. It's called Pink Blossom. Okay. Um, it's again about... What's that about? about? <clears throat> well, it's again about women from Dhaka. Okay. And this time I'm looking at the ultra rich class of mm -hmm. Dhaka women um, and their private lives and their, uh, it's more cerebral. Um, okay. And then of course the sequel of Made in Bangladesh is something that I have been uh, researching and it's going to take a long time because it's an ambitious project. I want to look at 
Bangladeshi women who are working in Jordan or Saudi Arabia. Sure. Um, so it will take a more investigation and research. Mm -hmm. While you say Bangladeshi women, I, while I was watching it, as I think of it, it's much more universal. Definitely. It could be, you know, your film could be anywhere in India. It could be the streets of Kolkata that I know well. And um, <clears throat> even in the West, you know, dividing where women are still struggling to, for certain rights, for equality, and for basic, you know, security. So, so it's much, much more universal and people will see it in that light, you know, from me and from my perspective. So it's got to, you know, going along and I wish you all the very best. And I know it's going to be a huge success at our festival. So thank you. And I'm so excited that to be showing this film at the festival. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I hope we meet in person someday.